So this morning we're continuing our series, um, going through the Great Commissions, and today we're at John. And for any of you who are new, we have got we just got finished going through Revelation, and so our next theme is evangelism. So before we can go, get into evangelism, evangelism and get into Acts, we want to first go through the Great Commissions, and today we're at the Great Commission found in John. Now before I start, I want to share a story with you. And this is a story that one of our church members shared with me. And don't worry, I got permission, so you, you don't have to worry. If you tell me stuff, I'm not going to use it in a sermon unless I get permission. So don't worry, you can't be like, I can't talk to that pastor. But I got permission, and he even emailed me something. So I'm going to tell you the story that he told me. And it says that once he went to a place called Barizona, which is located in Will Williams, Arizona, near the Grand Canyons. And he says the best way to describe it, it is much like Fossil Rim, only it specializes in North American animals, such as wolves, buffaloes, etc., and of course bears. As we were driving through, we were fascinated to see that even though the bears had acres in which to roam, many of them had worn a, worn a path about 10 feet they would travel back and forth. So curiosity le led them to ask about th this behavior. The park employees explained to, to them that many of their bears had previously been captured or had been captive uh, bears and that they were pacing back and forth in that small area because even though they had all their room in their minds, they were still stuck in the cage. You know, today, I think many of us are just like these bears. We, we like routine, don't we? And I mean, to tell a story about myself, in the mornings, I like to go work out at the Real Performance Gym. So, and it's interesting, because every morning, no matter what, I always put my gym bag in the exact same locker. And what's interesting is there's a man who works out with me, and he, ha he does the exact same t thing too, and we were talking about it. Every morning he puts his stuff in the exact same locker, he puts his stuff on the exact same bench, and even more, he has the exact same shower. And we were talking, I was like, what happens if we like switch things up? And he's like, you know, one day someone took my locker. <laughs> and he said, it ruined my whole day. <laughs> my friends, isn't that kind of same, same thing with us? We like our comfort zones. We like our routines. And my friends, I think that's the biggest problem with our church today. So before we dig into the Bible, let's once again invite God's presence into the sanctuary. Dearly Father, Lord, my God, my Savior, my King, Lord, this morning, we just want to hear you. So Lord, I pray that you hide me behind your cross, that you give me your strength, and that my words may be only your words. Lord, we love you so much, and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. So this morning, please turn with me to John, John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 19 and 23. John chapter 20, verses 19 and 23. And God's word says this. In John chapter 20, verses 19 and 23, it says, on, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this, uh, and after he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his, sin, his sins, they are forgiven. And, and if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So here we have, what John, here we have John's great commission. But if you notice, it's not as long as all the others, right? This one's like the fat-free version. But I want you to know something, because I believe that John wasn't so focused on the Great Commission, but he was focused on the Great Re-Commission. So I want you to continue. Follow me again in John chapter 20, verses 24. It says, Now Thomas, 
one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nails marked, the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Do you notice that? They're still in the house. And Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put them into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said, said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then finally it says, in verse 30, it says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. And you know, for any other book, this is a great ending. I mean, we have Matthew where it just stops at the Great Commission. Nothing. But here we have, he took away all their doubt, and then there's even a personal message for us, for the reader, that we may believe because of what we read. But if you notice, there's another chapter, chapter 21. And this is why I believe that John was more worried about the recommission than the commission. Because I want you to see what happens. Go with me to, to chapter 21, verse 1. It says, afterwards, Jesus appeared, uh, appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from, from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we're going with you. So they went out and got into the boat, by, but that night they caught nothing. Did you see what happened? What did we just read? They were just given the Great Commission, but yet just a few verses later, what are they doing? They're fishing. And you know, as we read this, it makes me think, isn't this sometimes what we do? You know, we hear that, that amazing sermon that our heart's burning within us and we get that appeal where, you know, we're going to go change the world and then we get home and we get into our, our routine. We go back to our comfort zone and we do nothing. And this reminds me of a story of one of my buddies. Uh, we went to summer camp together at CYB and uh, we didn't go together, but we met there. And, you know, he... He had a kind of checkered life, you know, he was, try, he was trying to get his life back together. And he went to see why Beanie and the music and the devotions and all of it just impacted his life so much. So there, like the last day, they have, they did an appeal. And they said, if you want to be baptized, come out. And my buddy got baptized. And after he got baptized, the next month, him and I, we hung out. And for, for a month, he, he was doing great. We were together, and you could really just see the difference in him. But something happened. After that month was over, he went back to his old life. And you see, something happened, because after that moment, he continued to create a pattern. Because every year, he would go to summer camp, and he would get baptized, or rebaptized, And then he'd be good for a month, but then after that month was over, he relapsed. And he got back into his comfort zone, went back to his routine. And my friends, before we look down at him, don't we do the same thing? We say, yes, yes, yes. But then we get back into our old routine. Because my friends, sometimes I think we just forget that this world is not our home. And that we are here for one mission, for one goal. And that is tell the world about Jesus Christ because praise the Lord, he is coming soon. Amen. But my friends, if the disciples had forgotten it and they need a reminder, so do we sometimes.
Now I want you to continue with me in John starting uh, chapter 21 verses 4 to 14. And this is after they're out all night trying to catch and didn't catch anything. It says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and, I, and you will find some. When they, and when they did, they were unable to haul the net because the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they, when they landed, they saw a fire burning coals, there, um, b burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. Now before I continue, I've heard some sermons on this 153. There's nothing special about it other than that it was a lot of fish. And the reason that there's 153 is because they counted it and when John wrote this in his old age, he still remembered how many there was. So if you hear some pastors saying, well, if you do one plus five plus three, it, as, there's, no, there's nothing significant about it other than it was a lot of fish. But as we continue, so, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. My friends, the disciples need a reminder. I want you to go back with me to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And God's word says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gesseret, or Gensaret, with the people crowded around him and listening to the words of God, he saw at the water edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him <clears throat> to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to, the, the, to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all day and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had, they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish that, that, that they had taken. And so were, G, uh, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. For now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him. My friends, as we go back to John chapter 21, Jesus is reminding the disciples of the moment when he first told them to follow him. And my friends, sometimes we need a reminder too that we were not made, like, we were not made, or we're not here to fish, for fish, to fish for fishes, but we're here to be fishers of men. And, <clears throat> and I want you to look as we continue to go back to John chapter 21, verse 15. John chapter 21, verse 15. 
There's somebody I want us to take for a moment to imagine what it must have been like to be Peter. Because here it says that when Peter saw that it was Jesus, he jumped out of the boat and swam to him. And I'd give anything to hear or to know what Peter said to Jesus when they first met. But here we have Jesus. He says something to Peter in verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, as we go back, it's the first question that Jesus asked said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? What was Jesus asking Simon? What are the these? Well, it's interesting because in Greek, Greek is way different than English. And there's only two options that it could be. The first one is when Jesus said, Simon, do you love me more than these? He could have been pointing at the fish. And if he was pointing at the fish, there's two things we can get out of this. Do you love me more than the money you're going to make from this? And do you love me more than your job? But there's a second thing it could be. The second thing these could be is he could have been pointing at the disciples. And he could have been saying, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than your fellow man? Do you love me more than the world? Or even, maybe he's taking him back to the last promise that Peter said to him. When he said, no matter even if everybody forsakes you, I will not. And remember how that turned out, right? He denied Jesus three times and even said, I do not know the man. But what's so interesting here is, how many times did Jesus deny, uh, did Peter deny Jesus? How many times does Jesus ask him the question? Three. For every time Peter denied Jesus, Jesus had an invitation for him. And I want you to continue with me. In verse 18 it says, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the greatest mystery of salvation. We are saved to die. You don't believe me? Turn with me to Luke. <clears throat> to Luke chapter 9, verses 11. What is that? Luke chapter 9. Oh, sorry. Luke chapter 9, verses 23. Sorry about that. Luke chapter 9, verses 23. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Then he said to them, If anyone come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. My friends, for salvation, to be saved, we must first die. And what's so amazing about this text in Luke 9, verse 23, is that in the time of the Romans, there were three main ways to die. Three main ways. The first one was they would burn you at the stake. The second one is they would put you in a bag full of scorpions and then throw you in a lake to drown. And the third one, which was the most painful, which was the worst of them all, was crucifixion. So Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross daily. My friends, if we need to follow, if we want to follow Jesus, we have to put away the things of this world. We need to die daily and follow him. Because my friends, the biggest problem as a church is because we're so stuck in our comfort zone 
that we're not able to reach the world. And my friends, if Jesus had to get out of his comfort zone to come down to this dreary world, how much more do you and I need to get out of our comfort zone to tell the world? Now go back with me to John chapter 21, verses 15 and 17. Because there's a word play here. And you've probably seen this before. But in John chapter 21, verse 15 and 17, it says, When they, heard, they had finally finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And as you first read this, you just, it looks like it's the exact same, just love, love, love. But what's interesting is in the Greek, right here is used two different words for love. And that's totally different from English because in English, like you can love your mom and you can love pizza. But in the Greek, there's different words for this because in the Greek, Jesus uses a word, the, the word for love, agape, or agapeo. And Peter uses the word phileo. Now to, now to help you understand this, agape is a love based on principle. I love you because I love you. Phileo is a love based on emotions. So to, so to the, best, the best as I can to explain this, I want you to think back, did you ever remember what, what it was like when you first found that special someone? When you first started dating someone, they, they have something called puppy love. Do you remember that? And I'm not talking about the love that Lee Bullock has towards his puppies. <laughs> but I'm talking about puppy love. When, when you're, you're up all night on the phone with that significant someone, that special someone, and you have what I like to call the eternal goodbye. Do you guys remember that? No, you hang up. No, you hang up. It goes on like that for hours. That's phileo. It's the love based on emotion. But agapeo, or agape love, it's the love based on principle. So that's after that significant someone becomes your spouse. And you've been married together so long that you've had a few little ones. And those few little ones have grown up to be a few big ones. And even though you've been married so long, your husband still doesn't know what a laundry basket is. <laughs> but nonetheless, you still love him. Agape love is, even after all these years, your wife still cooks that one meal that you just don't like. And it's been a long, hard day, and you come home, you're tired, you're hungry, and there it is. But she's worked so hard on it. And even though in your head you're like, I'd rather eat what the dog's having. You, you eat it and you say, honey, that was delicious. And you know what? I'll even do the dishes. My friends, that's what agape love. It's a love based on principles and not feelings. I love you because I love you. So going back to John 21, verses 15 and 17, Whenever there's agape love, I'm going to replace it with love. But when it's phileo, I'm going to replace it with like. So let's read it one more time. It says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I like you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I like you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you like me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I like you. My friends, can it be said that we like Jesus? Because my friends, it's one thing to say you love Jesus, but do you like him? Do you want to talk to him 24-7? Do you want to be with him? Do you want to walk with him? Is, is, he the, is he the thing that's on your mind daily? My friends, do we even like, do we even like Jesus? Because my friends, we have to like Jesus before we can say we love him. And as we see here, he says that if you love me, what are we to do? We are to feed 
his sheep. And my friends, before I get to my final point, there's a problem with our church today because the way we do church isn't working. Two years ago, I had the privilege and honor to go to to go to the year in me, the NAD year in meeting. For those of you who are like me, wondering what that is, it's pretty much a board meeting on steroids. It's where all the people in the church get together and they go over annual reports and they, and they vote on new policies. And as I was there, they're going on a membership annual report. And as they are going over it, I saw something from the numbers. And it shows that our church is stagnant. And that the only reason our numbers are going up is because people are moving from different countries and coming to America. Because the thing is, as many people as we have coming into our church, we have leaving our church. And my friends, as we go back to our, 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 our verse here, in chapter 21, verses 15 and 17, I believe we, found that we find the cure for this problem. We find the solution. Because the word for feed my lambs is the herdsman word for, tin, for a herdsman to tin and to feed his lambs. And when it says take care of my sheep, it's the word for to shepherd my sheep. My friends, as a church, for us to solve this problem, we need to, do, we need to take care and we need to feed our sheep. It's not enough just to have them come here and take care of their spiritual needs, but we need to take care of their physical needs also. And as we're reading this, I just, before we continue, I just want to commend you as a church for what you're already doing. Because our motto is a caring church. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because you live up to your name. You are a caring church. I have friends, the young adults, they come to, they come to uh, the church here and I ask them, I'm like, hey, be honest, what do you think? And they say, you know, I feel welcome. I feel like they, ac they actually care for me. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank our elders because they do shepherd the flock. They visit, they love. But my friends, we have a problem. And that problem is, is that there's a black hole in our church. And that black hole is our young people. And I, when I first got here, I had multiple people grab me by the arm, and I'm paraphrasing here, and they said, you have one job, and that's to get young people here. And my friends, I have a question for you. What would happen today if by God's grace, we had 20 students from Hill College, unchurched, non-Christians, walk through these doors? What would we do? Would they feel welcome? Would they come back? And when I left, would they stay? Because my friends, just to be honest, I'm only here for two years. Because my friends, our youth deserves more than a youth pastor. They need a church family. Yes. And my friends, this morning, as we look back in our verse, and the first thing Jesus says is to feed my lambs. And what's interesting is in the Greek, this word is actually the word for baby lambs. So the first thing that Jesus wants us to do if we love him is to take care of his lambs. And who are his lambs? They could be two things. Those who newly come to our church or our young people. And today, I want to share something with you. Because there's a book read by Ed, written by Ed Stinsler, Sinsler. And he talks about seven ways to impact a young person's life. And I just want to share this quickly with you because when I read it, it changed my life. And the first way is to ask God to make you a mentor to them. And he continues to say, when people from older generations invite young people into their lives, they have that chance to mentor them. But check this out. It says, too many young adults today have no one to turn to when it comes to tough questions at, of life as faith, marriage, life, and work. But even more, it says, and also the practical questions of life 
changing oil, preparing taxes, and building a resume. My friends, young people out there today need you. You are what the young people need. They don't need loud music. They don't need all these excitements. They just need you to love them and be there for them. And the second one, oh, sorry, I missed a quote. It says, churches that connect generations can be wonderful bodies of believers who respect each other in every facet of congregational life. The second one is to go deep with them. Young people today don't, young people today want you to go deep. They don't want you to be shallow. They don't want you to be fake. They have enough of that in the world. And, a stu and, they, <clears throat> and the study showed that young adults are looking for, a stri uh, for and striving towards truth. They care about who, uh, who they are and what they are becoming. Ankle deep doesn't work for them. They rather be over their heads as opposed to kicking it around on the shallow side. My friends, Young people are looking for the truth. And I want, to sh I want to share a story with you really quickly. When I, when I was at the university, I had the honor to be in charge of the Sabbath school. And when I was in charge of the Sabbath school, first, I, I didn't go by the Sabbath school quarterly. I was just like, well, bring in speakers, have them speak on whatever they want. And God opened my eyes because I asked my young people, like, what, or I asked my young people, my college students, my friends, what do you guys want? And they said, you know what? We just want the Sabbath school lesson. We want the Bible. We don't care about speaker, but we want to dig into the truth ourselves. The third one is model your values. My friends, young people don't want you to dress like them. They don't even want you to talk like them, but they want you to show them how to live. And a quote that I thought was interesting, it says, only 31% of unchurched young adults said yes to, if music at church sounded similar to my favorite type of music, I would be more likely to attend. My friends, it's not about the music. It's about the love. Amen. Do the young adults feel like they're welcome and that they belong here? And the fourth one says, draw them into the community of a small group. Now, when I read this statistic, it blew my mind. It says 47% of unchurched youth would join a small group to learn about Jesus. That's 47% of unchurched. You know how easy this could be? What if you and a group of your friends, you want to read about John? So you go through and you're going to read John, and you find a young person in our church and he said, you know what? I have a group of my friends coming together. Why don't you and some of your friends come? And we'll even bring food. We'll even have food. They'll come. Trust me. <laughs> and say, just come join us. You know, once a week, maybe once every other week, just come join us. We just want to, you know, read the Bible together. My friends, as the saying says, if you build it, they will come. Number five, do ministry with them in the church. What would it be like? And you can tell me, this is probably a crazy idea. Good thing I'm a baby pastor. But what would it be like if we had young adults sometimes teaching the adult Sabbath schools? Number six, it says, do service with them in the community. And I want you to read the statistic. It says, oh, oh no, oh man. Oh, the statistic isn't there. Oh, that was my fault. So the statistic is that 40% of young people who after participating in community service 12 months later will not be, will not be using drugs. That's 40% 12 months later will not be doing drugs. My friends, we need to be serving with them. And finally, the seventh one, volunteer to minister to them when they are 12 or under. And I want you to read this statistic. It says, we discovered that the probability of someone embracing Jesus as his or her savior was 32% for those between five and 12. Yeah. And I want you to watch this. 4% for those in, in the 13 to 18 age range, 4%. And 6% for people 19 or older. My friends, why are we waiting until they get older? In other words, 
And this is from the Barna Group. It says, if people do not embrace Jesus Christ as their savior before they reach teenage years, the chance, the chance they're doing so is slim. When I was in college, I, I had a friend of mine come to me. He was huge in coal porting. And I, I love coal porting, but I wanted to work at summer camp. And he came to me and he said, he's like, you should be a coal porter. And I was like, man, but I want to work at summer camp. He's like, no, 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 you, you need to be a coal porter. And I was like, man, I just, I love you with the kids. I, I, I just want to work at summer camp. And he's like, okay. He's like, you can work at a summer camp, but wouldn't you agree that coal porting is the better ministry? And he's like, because we are doing what Jesus is doing. We are going to the doors and knocking on them. And as I thought of that, I said, yeah, but at summer camp, by ministering to the children, by the time you knock on their door, they already have the book. My friends, why are we waiting until they get old to try to teach them about their Lord and Savior? My friends, we need to be in the Sabbath school rooms now. We need to be taking families in and helping guide them and mentor them into knowing about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have three stories, and then, I'm, then I'll close. The first story, I told you that I used to help with the Sabbath school. And so I was helping with the Sabbath school. It was a big weekend. It was actually about four years from this date. Um, during basketball tournament, we brought in a speaker and some back, just some back knowledge about the Sabbath school. We created a Sabbath school. Um, and when I was a freshman, I came in and I wanted a job at Spiritual Life and Development. And they're like, yeah, we'll put you on Sabbath school. And I, I was so scared. I had no clue about Sabbath school. So that day she gave me a book and I read it. And I came back and I'm like, I read the book. She's like, you read the book? And I'm like, yeah, I read the book. I was so scared. I had no clue anything about Sabbath school. And the Sabbath school, when it first started, the max... The max people that went there were 30 students. And when, when, I, when I got in there, I had no clue. And I was like, God, you got to do something because I have no clue what to do. And by the end of the year, by God's grace, we had 170 kids going. Amen. The second year, by God's grace, we had 200 students going. And the student body is less than 800. We had one-fourth of the student body going to Sabbath school. And that's only by God's grace. So here we are, it's a big weekend, we're excited, and we just started a new ministry. We called it Across the Street. And Across the Street was where our college students went across the street to minister to the children's Sabbath schools. They did all the way from third grade to eighth grade, and they would go in and our college students would put on the Sabbath school for them. And so we're just starting, we're so excited about it, we invite the speaker in, and the first, first words he says is, children ministry does not work. And the rest of the sermon, he begins to tell us that the Sabbath school that we're doing is abomination and that it should not be happening and that we should be in the adult Sabbath school with the adults. I had, I, that day I was like, oh man, I lost my job. And he kept on going and finally I had some friends come up to me afterwards and they said, you know, we actually believe what he says. He's like, we should be over there. But he said, not once have we ever had adult Sabbath school come to us and say, you know what? We want you to come in. My friend, young people are looking for that mentorship. Young people are looking for you to connect the bridge. My friend, young adults are waiting for us to bring them in. Yeah. All we need to do is to get out of our comfort zone and say, come on in. The second story is about a conversation I had with a young man. Uh, we were at Taco Bell. Uh, I wasn't the healthiest, but we were at Taco Bell. Was, we were college student, college budget. And we're at Taco Bell, and we're eating together. And the young man starts telling me a story. And he says, you know, I used to be, I used to be out in the boonies. I was doing a, just a job there. And there were two churches. One church had all the music, was made for young adults, the other one was just an old-timey church. And I was like, oh, which one did you go to? And he said, you know what? I went into the one with all the lights, with all the music, but when I walked in, I didn't feel welcome. When I went to the old-timey church, as I stepped in, there was a dear old lady who said, welcome to our church. Come sit with me. 
and she invited me to her house for potluck. He said, I was there for two years and every Sabbath I went to her church because of her. My friends, young adults aren't looking for music. They're not looking for that. They're just looking for a place where they belong. And finally, my third story. Just this last Thursday, I met a man by the name of Dwayne. Um, he's a business owner, just recently retired. His wife has passed away, and he's like, you know, I'm bored, I'm restless. And he was telling me about his church he, he participates in. And as he was telling me about his church, he's like, oh, you know, I have a question for you. And I was like, yeah, what's your question? He's like, do you have young people? And I was like, yeah, yeah, we have young people. And I was like, does your church? He's like, yeah, we have young people. Our youngest one's 50. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And he's like, yeah. He says, it, it worries me. And I was like, really? And he's like, I go to church every, every um, he goes to church on Sunday, but every Sunday I go to church. And as I go there, I look around and I say, what's gonna happen when we leave? What's gonna happen when we pass? He's like, our, t our, our pastor's 76. What's gonna happen when he pass? My friends, the young people aren't just our future. They are the church. Amen. And in, in John 21, verses 15 to 17, it says, if you love me, feed my lambs. My friends, as a church, we need to be following God's last recommission, and we need to be feeding God's lambs. Amen. At this time, I'd like to uh, invite the deacons to please stand. Um, and they're going to be passing out a little card. And in the card, there's going to be a few boxes. And the card's going to look like this. And on it says, I would like to serve Christ by volunteering with. And there's a few boxes. First, praise the Lord, we have an amazing Pathfinder group. Amen? Amen. But the Pathfinder group is in need of some volunteers. So if you're feeling God is pulling your heart to help, help with God's last recommission to feed, God, uh, to feed his lambs, I invite you to put a check for Pathfinders. You also see there's boxes for creator role for kindergarten. These are some Sabso classes that are in need, are in dire need of some more help. My friends, we got to mentor them before they're young so that when they're older, they will know which way to go. Lastly, on the bottom, you see there's AY, there's adventurers, and Lord, uh, and AY and adventurers, and if you're feeling that God's pulling you, that you, pulling you towards these ministries to minister to our youth, I'd invite you to put a check on that box. And finally, there's one last box, and this box is carrying home. And I want to challenge you to be a carrying home. What is a carrying home? A caring home is I, I challenge you to pick, if, if you check the box, to pick one, to, we'll put you with one young adult, one young family, and maybe just, you know, once a week, get together with this young family, with this young adult, and just have lunch, just have brunch, just have dinner. Maybe have a small Bible study with it. If, if, if you're bored, if you, if you need something in your life, this could be it. My friends, there are young families, there are young adults that are needing someone to be there for him. And my friends, as a caring church, we can also be a caring home. So if you're feeling like God's tugging you to this, I'd invite you to just put a check. And when you're done, um, put your name, your number, and your email, and you can pass them in to the middle of the rows. And finally, I'd like to read one last quote. And this quote is from Dwight Nelson. <clears throat> and it says, We believe that us going to church is about us getting fed, but in reality, it is about us feeding other people. My friends, the reason we come to church is to do what God would have us do and to feed his sheep. And today, I would invite you to finish, the, to fulfill God's last recommission to you and to feed his sheep, and to feed his lambs. Let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, our God, our Savior, and our King, Lord, thank you so much for your love
and for your son. And Lord, today we just pray that you be with us, that you give us the strength, you give us the wisdom to go out and to feed your sheep, and most importantly, Lord, to feed your lambs. May we be able to love them and may we be able to tell them that this is a place where they belong, or a place where we want them to be. Lord God, we just love you so much and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.